All right. Welcome, everyone. Welcome back. Welcome to the second uh, study in the Maranatha Global Bible Study. We're looking at Daniel chapters 7 through 12. Okay, so from the center of the book of Daniel to the end, myself and Dalton Thomas are tag teaming, going back and forth and uh, working through this. I'm actually doing the first four sessions, and then Dalton will jump in, and as I said, we'll go back and forth. Now, if perchance you're watching this not on the Frontier Alliance International app, but you're watching it on YouTube, then by all means, download the Frontier Alliance International app so that you can get all of the classes. Go to any app store and search Frontier Alliance International, download the app, and this is part of the Maranatha Global Bible Study. Okay, now in the last uh, study, let me just say I went over an hour. I apologize. We're in the middle of the coronavirus crisis. Everyone's on lockdown. Maybe we can tolerate something that long now, um, but for the most part, we're going to stick to about 45 minutes. So I promise to do that today. Okay, so um, in the last study, we looked at Daniel uh, chapter 7, verses 1 through 8, I believe. Yes, 1 through 8. And then we jumped forward and we looked a little bit at verses 11 and 12. Okay, so today we're going to look at really the heart and the center and the most important part of this chapter. In fact, I would argue the most important part of the whole book of Daniel. So verses 9 through uh, 14. Yeah, 9 through 14. And this really is, as I said, the heart of the book. Now, this is important. In order to understand, in order to properly understand the structure, the way the book of Daniel was written, um, it's, it's written in what's called a chiastic structure. And you are, what are you talking about? Okay, it's actually really simple, but it's important. In modern times, when, for instance, when I write books, I either will clearly state the point that I want to make at the beginning of the book, and then I develop my case, and then I conclude by restating the point that I want to make. Oftentimes, people will build and then finally state their case, that, but it's usually at the beginning or the end that the primary point is made. Either it's made and then it's defended, or it's made and it's built and then it's finally summarized, this type of thing. In biblical times and throughout the Bible, you have passages, you have prophecies, you have entire books that are written in what is called a chiastic structure. What does that mean? That means that the main point is actually right in the center, right in the middle. And so think of it like a mountain. Think of the book of Daniel like a mountain. Daniel chapter 7 is the peak. And so what happens is going up the mountain and then coming down the mountain, the points that are made as we, as we made our way to Daniel chapter 7, they will actually be reiterated and expanded upon after chapter 7. Okay, but again, the points made here in chapter 7, this is the pinnacle. This is the mountain peak, the center, the most important part of the entire book, of this incredibly important book of Daniel. Now, here's what's interesting, is that there is a chiasm within a chiasm, which is to say that the verses we're about to look at, again, 9 through 14, that is a peak on top of the peak. It's a wheel within a wheel. Type. Now, actually, we're going to look at that um, in, this, in this study, Ezekiel's wheel within a wheel. But... Um, it is essentially a mountain peak on top of a mountain peak. And this is the center, the focus, the culmination of the entire book of Daniel. And in the verses that we're about to look at really is um, a, a concise summary, an articulation, an Old Testament articulation of the gospel of the kingdom in a powerful, powerful way. And it's also in many ways the, the culmination and the capstone of Old Testament progressive revelation concerning the coming one, the promised one, the Messiah. Because this concept of the Messiah is unfolding throughout the scriptures. And when you get to Daniel 7, it just brings all of these different ideas that were previously articulated by different prophets, and it just brings them all together. And then what we're going to look at, it just, again, concisely summarizes this unfolding revelation in an absolutely profound and powerful way. And it's easy to miss. It's easy to miss if we don't really dial down and pay attention. Now, let me say this uh, real quick before we jump in. 
Um, if you really want to dig into Daniel 7 much, much more, I do recommend that you get this book by Samuel Whitfield, friend of mine, uh, son of man, the gospel of Daniel 7. He's got two volumes. He's got this one and a second one. Get it. It's a great book. It's a classic book. It's a timeless book. It's brand new, and it will be relevant until Jesus returns. It's a very important study. Okay, so here's what I'm going to do. I'm actually going to read all of these verses from the NIV, okay, and then we're going to come back and start parsing through, but in my notes on my iPad, um, I've got the NASB. So we'll actually, we'll actually go back and forth and read uh, two different translations. Okay, so again, in the previous discussion, uh, again, just to recap, it's talking, Daniel chapter 7 is talking about four beasts that arise from the earth. And as we discussed, these beasts represent historical empires. They are pagan, satanically empowered empires. I believe that these are the same, same empires that had been previously referred to uh, in Daniel chapter 2 that were spoken of through Nebuchadnezzar's uh, dream of this metallic statue with these various components here in chapter 7, they're beasts. Now, uh, the beasts have been introduced, and out of the fourth beast, because there's four, out of the fourth beast comes this horn. It's a little horn, but it is an arrogant little horn. <laughs> you arrogant little horn! Um, it is, it's boastful, and it's speaking out blasphemies against God. Okay, this is Ultimately, it's the Antichrist, okay? It's, it was talking about the Antichrist. And so that's why it now shifts to this heavenly scene, and it's just an incredibly uh, important scene. So as I looked, thrones were set in place, and the Ancient of Days took his seat. His clothing was as white as snow. The hair of his head was as white as wool. His throne was flaming with fire, and its wheels, there's the wheels, the wheels of the throne were all ablaze. A river of fire was flowing, coming out from before him. Thousands upon thousands attended him. Ten thousand times ten thousand stood before him. The court was seated, and the books were opened. And then here's 11 and 12. We discussed this in the last study. Then I continued to watch because of the boastful words the horn was speaking. I kept looking until the beast was slain, and its body destroyed and thrown into the blazing fire. And then there's this parenthetical statement. The other beasts had been stripped of their authority, but they were allowed to live for a period of time. And then it comes back. In my vision at night, I looked, and there before me was one like a son of man. This is why I say this is the center of the entire book of Daniel, because all biblical prophecy is about Jesus. It's not first and foremost about the beast. It's not first and foremost about the Antichrist. It's not about that little horn. It's not about the mark of the beast and the tribulation. Those things are all important. Okay, we, The Bible talks about them in great detail, and we should study them. But we always need to remember the heart and the center of the story is the, the Messiah, the promised one, the coming one, who is, by the way, it's not just, and this is important to state, it's not just that he is the one that's coming back to fix everything. It's not just the one that he's the one that's coming back to heal everything. It's not just that he's the one that's going to take away the pain and the groan and the sighing that we all feel. That's wonderful. But it's much more than that. It's the fact that he is, as we'll see, he is the revelation of God himself, our creator. There's nothing else in the universe that we as humans need and yearn for and desire more than to know the one who made us. Because when we, can, we talk about a restored earth, we talk about a healed earth, that's beautiful, that's glorious, but we only love it in as much as it reflects the God who made the earth itself. And so Jesus, the Son of Man, the Messiah, Whatever title we want to give to him, whatever name we want to give to him, he is the essence of the God of all creation revealed to us. God is a self-revealing one. And so that's why right here at the center of the book is the self-revelation of God. And so here he is, one like a son of man, and he was coming with the clouds of heaven. He's proceeding forward, riding, if you will, the clouds of heaven. And he approached the Ancient of Days, and he was led into his presence. He was given authority 
glory and sovereign power and all nations and peoples of every language worshiped him his dominion is an everlasting dominion that will not be that will not pass away and his kingdom is one that will never be destroyed and so again i touched on this last week the purpose of verse 12 when it says the other beasts weren't destroyed instantly as opposed to the fourth beast, the kingdom of the Antichrist. That's destroyed completely, utterly, immediately, and totally. The purpose of that is to juxtapose, is to contrast the nature of the destruction of the fourth kingdom, the Antichrist kingdom, with the kingdom of the Messiah. It will last forever. It's a dominion that will never pass away. His, it's going to be destroyed, okay? All right, so there it is. Those are the primary uh, passages, verses that we're going to look at. Now let's go ahead and just jump into parsing through because there is so much here. So again, we'll begin with the first two verses, and I'll reiterate from uh, the NASB. I kept looking until thrones were set up, and the Ancient of Days took his seat. His vesture, his clothing was white like snow. The hair of his head was like pure wool. His throne was ablaze with flames. I like that better. It was ablaze with flames. Its wheels were a burning fire. A river of fire was flowing and coming out before him. Thousands upon thousands were attending him. Myriads upon myriads were standing before him. The court sat and the books were opened. So essentially what we have here, we have here is a picture of the throne room, the heavenly throne room. And you go, well, what's the heavenly throne room? I mean, we can imagine... Because the Bible says, by the way, the Bible says that God dwells at the height of the heavens, which, you know, every time I I think about this, I have to point it out because it's so cool, is that in the beginning, God created the heavens, okay, he created the heavens and the earth, and then he placed his throne at the height of the heavens. In other words, again, God has chosen to dwell within creation. That's what the scriptures say. And that alleviates this cosmic loneliness that we all ultimately feel. He is the God who draws near. He is the God who wants to reveal himself. He is not just this distant, transcendent. He's a big, big, big God. He's beyond our ability to fathom and know. But he draws near. He's the one who wants us to know him. He is the self-revealing one. He is the sharing God. And that's That's a big part of why he has stepped into his creation. And ultimately, when all is said and done, he will dwell amongst us, right? Okay, but here's the throne room of heaven, at the height of the heavens. Because it's not just the earth and heaven. It's not just heaven and earth. It's the earth and the heavens, okay? And at the height of the heavens is the throne room of God. And this is the the courtroom of God. And this is something that um, Dr. Michael Heiser, for those of you that are familiar, he talks about this a lot in his book, Unseen Unseen Realm. It's a concept that's actually found throughout the scriptures. Um, And he sits, what's amazing is God sits on his throne, but there are others that sit as part of his divine counsel. You go, wait a minute, you're trying to say that it's a pantheon? No, there is one supreme God, But there are other divine beings, and they are, by the way, in the Bible called Elohim. They are actually called gods. They're not not the one true God. They're not the creator. They are all created beings, but they are, and they're not just angels. This is, again, from a Christian perspective, we go, I thought there's God and there's angels. There's much more than just angels. These are divine, heavenly beings, and God actually talks to them and consults with them. And we need to kind of understand this because it's a, it's crazy, but it's a very biblical concept. Okay, so for example, Psalm 82, verse 1. God, that's Elohim, there in the Hebrew, has taken his place in the divine council. You mean God listens to other divine beings and talks to them and when he makes his decisions? That's what the scriptures say. In the midst of the gods, same word, Elohim. In the midst of the gods, he holds judgment. So this is, again, the same picture that's being spoken of in Daniel 7. It is the divine council, the heavenly throne room. Psalm 89, 5 through 7. Let the heavens praise your wonders, O Lord, your faithfulness in the assembly of the holy ones. There's this assembly, this gathering of these divine beings. Sometimes the scriptures call them principalities. The book of Daniel calls them watchers. They're more than just angels. These are powerful heavenly beings that God created. 
and they actually some of them some of them actually um, are rebellious. The Bible says some of them actually fell, but they help God actually to carry out. They actually it's not that God needs help, but they assist God in carrying out His sovereignty over all creation. And I know that sounds crazy, but that is what the scriptures teach. It says, for who is in the skies can be compared to the Lord? Who among the heavenly beings is like the Lord? A God greatly to be feared in the counsel of the holy ones and awesome and awesome above all who are around him. Again, Psalm 89, 5 through 7. Now check this out. 1 Kings 22, 19 through 23. This is crazy. Micaiah, a prophet, he said, therefore, hear the word of the Lord. I saw the Lord sitting on his throne, again, in the throne room of heaven, and all the host of heaven were standing beside him on his right hand and on his left. And the Lord said this, Who will entice Ahab, that he may go up and fall at Ramoth Gilead? And one said one thing, another said another. So these heavenly divine beings, he goes, who's going to do this for me? And they're all offering different suggestions. Verse 19, then a spirit, so one of these heavenly beings, came forward and stood before the Lord and said, I will entice him. And the Lord said, by what means? And he said, I will go out and I will be a lying spirit in the mouth of his prophets. And he said, you are to entice him and you shall succeed. The Lord speaks to the spirit. He says, you will entice him and you will succeed. Go out and do so. Now, therefore, behold, the Lord has put a lying spirit into the mouth of all of these prophets. The Lord has declared disaster for you. This principality goes and carries out the sovereign will of the Lord. And it's very strange, guys, I know, because it's a lying spirit. Okay, so then in back in Daniel chapter 4, Similar references, verse 13 and 14. I saw in the visions of my head as I lay in bed, and behold, a watcher, a holy one, came down from heaven. And this is the term that's referred to in the book of Daniel. Um, we see it uh, also in the book of Enoch, references to the watchers. And I may be wrong, but I think it may reference this in Ezekiel as well. Ezekiel, of course, uh, within the same time period as the book of Daniel. Okay, so where does this all take place? It's in the courtroom, in the throne room of God, in the divine council at the height of the heavens. Okay, and then it refers to this one called the Ancient of Days. Now, Christians, we would refer to this as God. Yes, because it is God. We would say this is God the Father. God the Father, the Ancient of Days. It's the only time this specific title is used, and it's a evocative title. I mean, you know, the ancient of days. He is before all things. But here's what's interesting, and, and this really is fascinating, is that he is described, Daniel sees him, and he is described using anthropomorphic terms, which is to say he has the form of a human. The ancient of days has the form of a human. He sits down, he's wearing clothing, his vestiges were like uh, white, as, white as the snow, and he has hair on his head. He's got a head of woolly hair, right? His hair is like wool. And so even the Ancient of Days, and that's important to qualify, he's not just this big orb of light type of thing. He is described in anthropomorphic terms, and he's sitting on a throne in the midst of these other holy ones, because not all of the heavenly beings are in the form of a man or in the form of a human. Some of them are anything but that, but the Ancient of Days is like us. And again, we are created in his image. He created mankind in his image. And it's, it's difficult to know exactly what that means. Um, but he is described in anthropomorphic terms. Now, the throne of God, and this is really fascinating. This is often what's called in Hebrew, the Merkaba. Okay, it's not just a throne. It's a chariot throne. It's a throne with wheels, and that's exactly how it's described here. It says that, you know, it's got the, the wheels of the throne are all ablaze. And you go, wait a minute, his throne, we think of a throne as a seat, but he's sitting on a chariot with wheels that are on fire. Now we have to read, because this is, again, from the same time period, and it's so relevant, we have to read, it's in Ezekiel uh, chapter 1, as well as, I think, 15, but we'll just, it essentially reiterates the same thing. But let's look at one, we'll read 1 through 21 or so, the beginning of the book of Daniel. 
In my 13th year, in the fourth month, on the fifth day, while I was among the exiles at the Kibar River, the heavens were opened and I saw visions. So Ezekiel sees these visions. Uh, it was the fifth year of the king of Jehoiakim. The word of the Lord came to Ezekiel the priest. And then he looked and I saw a windstorm coming up out of the north, an immense cloud and flashing lightning, sound surrounded by brilliant light. The center of the fire looked like glowing metal, and in the fire was what looked like four living creatures. Okay, so here are these heavenly beings. They're living creatures. In appearance, their form was human, but each of them had four faces. (laughs) Oh, well, wait a minute. And four wings. Four faces and four wings. Did they have four heads? It says they had the human form, but four faces and four wings. Their legs were straight. Their feet were like those of a calf gleamed like burning bronze. Under their wings, on their four sides, they had human hands. All of them had faces and wings, and the wings of one touched the wings of another. Each one went straight ahead, and they did not turn as they moved. This is very interesting. They did not turn as they moved. Their faces looked like this. Each of the four had the face of a human being, and on the right side, the face of a lion, and on the left, the face of an ox, and each had the face of an eagle. Such were their faces. (laughs) They each had two wings spreading upward, each wing touching that of the creature on either side, and each uh, had two wings covering its body. Each one went straight ahead. Wherever the spirit would go, they would go without turning as they went. The appearance of the living creatures was like burning coals of fire or like torches. Fire moved back and forth among the creatures. It was bright, lightning. I mean, you know, just what in the world is happening here? The creatures sped back and forth like flashes of lightning. Verse 15, as I looked at the living creatures, I saw a wheel. I saw a wheel on the ground beside each creature with its four faces. So there's a wheel touching the ground wherever the four living creatures are. This was the appearance and the structure of the wheels. They sparkled like topaz. All four looked alike. Each appeared to me like a wheel intersecting a wheel, a wheel within a wheel. And as they moved, they would go in any one of the four directions that the creatures faced. The wheels did not change direction as the creatures went. Their rims were high and awesome. All four rims were covered with eyes. When the living creatures moved, the wheels beside them moved. They either went straight. When the living creatures rose from the ground, the wheels also rose. Wherever the spirit would go, they would go, and the wheels would rise along with them because the spirit of the living creatures was in the wheels. When the creatures moved, they also moved. When the creatures stood still, the wheels stood still. When the creatures rose from the ground, the wheels rose from the ground because the spirit of the living creatures was in the wheels. So... Again, we have to understand there's this concept that's articulated in Ezekiel. Again, um, a prophet and a priest, part of the exiles. He very well could have known Daniel. We don't know. I I believe he did probably know Daniel, right? And Daniel sees the same thing. The throne of God has wheels that are all ablaze. Now, here's what's fascinating is within Orthodox Judaism, um, again, as they've really poured into these things, there is a, a theory that the wheels themselves are living beings and that the living creatures are somehow interconnected with the wheels. And they're actually referred to, there's a term that they're called, Let's see if I can find it here. They are referred to, oh, I don't know. Oh, the Ophanim. Okay, the Ophanim um, are these living creatures. And what's interesting is in the, the Kedusha, okay, so that's the section of the morning Orthodox Jewish prayer said just before the Shema. Um, it includes this phrase. It includes this prayer. The Ophanim and the holy living creatures with great uproar rise themselves up facing the seraphim. They offer praise saying, blessed be God's glory from his place. So there's actually a reference to the wheels as if they are living creatures and that there's, you know, the cherubim and the seraphim and the ophanim and this type of thing. It's it's a rabbit hole that if you really want to go down it, it's fascinating. It's bizarre, admittedly bizarre, um, but it's part of the Word of God. It's these, the the chariot that God rides, it, it has wheels covered with eyes and they're all ablaze. They're, they're on fire. Okay, and then it says, so it's just, 
it's beyond our ability to truly grasp and comprehend, but yet the Lord tried to communicate it, and the prophets tried to communicate it to a degree. The court sat, and the books were opened. Okay, it's, you can just feel the solemnity uh, of the moment. So now we're going to touch on the two verses again that we have touched on previously. Then I kept looking because of the sound of the boastful words which the horn was speaking. Again, this is the Antichrist. I kept looking until the beast was slain. So there's a, there's a degree to where the horn is the beast and the beast is the horn. The horn is the human leader, the dictator of this empire. The beast represents the empire, but yet there's a degree to where they are one and the same. I mean, it's as though the beast has a horn and that's his mouth. And that's, that's how the beast speaks. He is the mouthpiece of this empire. And so there's this sort of telescoping um, uh, dynamic that you see oftentimes in the prophetic scriptures where you have kingdom, king, but they're almost treated as though they're one and the same. And Christians, it's funny, theologians, they get in arguments. Well, are you talking about the Antichrist or the empire? And I go, I'm talking about one or the other, or to a degree both, because the scriptures sometimes treat them almost as though they're one and the same. And you see it here. I kept looking because of the boastful words which the horn was speaking, and then I kept looking and the beast was slain. So it's as though the horn and the beast are treated as if they're one and the same. Until the beast was slain, its body was destroyed, and it was given to the burning fire. As for the rest of the beasts, again, their dominion was taken away, but an extension of life was granted to them. So it's thrown into the blazing fire. Now, I'm just going to touch on this briefly. Um, within biblical cosmic geography, I'll just say, there is this idea that the lake of fire, Gehenna, is actually located, or it will be located, um, just south of the present-day old city of Jerusalem, south of the Temple Mount, known as the Valley of Hinnom, the Valley of Gehenna. That's the uh, Greek um, modification of the Hebrew, Hinnom, the Valley of Hinnom. Okay, so you've got the Kidron Valley, you've got the Hinnom Valley, you've got three valleys there that sort of converge on the southern side of the Temple Mount. And, you know, there's a lot of discussion in theological circles, uh, historical circles, that that used to be the place that dead bodies were cast, that was the trash heap, um, and that Jesus pointed to it as this place of maggots and trash, and he said, you know, uh, he used it as a picture, uh, as kind of a metaphor of the coming spiritual judgment on the wicked. They will be cast into Gehenna. But there's actually, it's much more than just a, a metaphor. There's actually the idea that that is the location where it will be. And it talks about this in Isaiah. It says every year they'll go out and they'll look upon the bodies of those who are cast into Gehenna. And the flames never die. The worm never dies. And it's as though the bodies are never really consumed to remind them to actually, as a remembrance of God's justice and his judgment on the wicked. But here's the thing. The throne is, it's a river of fire is pouring out from the throne. So that's in heaven, but there's also kind of this, almost this idea that when the Messiah comes back, and we'll touch on this some more, his throne will be where? On Mount Zion. It's almost as if the, the river of fire that proceeds forth from the throne of the Messiah will fill and flood uh, the valley of Gehenna is as if that is the place where the lake of fire will be. I know it's strange and it's hard to sort of wrap our heads around in terms of what is to be understood as literal and what is more um, communicating spiritual realities that we can't really quite grasp. Um, but that is where the concept of the lake of fire comes from. And the scriptures are clear. The wicked will be cast into the lake of fire and there will be weeping and bitter regret and it does use the imagery of everlasting punishment. Now, in terms of what actually happens to the wicked, do they suffer agonizing pain, never ending forever and ever? Or do they suffer uh, until the Lord deems it, uh, that they've suffered enough, that they've paid, that they've um, paid for their sins, and they eventually burn up and disappear? Ultimately, we don't know. And the scriptures do use the language of eternity, but the scriptures often do use hyperbole, 
And we need just to say that this is a terrifying, terrifying reality. But the scriptures are clear. Jesus was clear that there is um, a place of punishment, conscious punishment for the wicked. And we want to be people that flee from the wrath to come. We want to flee to the refuge. We want to flee to the Savior, the Messiah. Amen? Right? Okay. Now we're going to look at verse 13. And this is... It's hard to say what is the pinnacle. I kept looking in the night visions, and behold, with the clouds of heaven, one like a son of man was coming. One like a son of man. And he came up to the Ancient of Days, and he was presented before him. To him was given dominion and glory and a kingdom that all the peoples, nations of every language might serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion which will not pass away, unlike the kingdoms of this world, unlike the fourth kingdom, unlike the fourth beast that will be destroyed and cast into the blazing fire. No, his kingdom will be everlasting. And it won't just be, it won't just be over Israel, right? It says that men of every language, all peoples, all nations might serve him. His dominion is an everlasting, universal dominion. It will not pass away. His kingdom is one that will never be destroyed. So first of all, we have to look at this theme. The Son of Man comes on the clouds of heaven. What does that mean from an Old Testament biblical perspective? Uh, because again, the book of Daniel is one of the later books in the Old Testament. And so it comes on the heels, it comes after so much previous revelation. So how would Daniel, who would have been, by the way, familiar with the writings of Jeremiah and Isaiah and Hosea and Joel and so many of the prophets that came before him, he would have been familiar with their writings. He would have been very familiar with the Psalms and the Proverbs. He would have been very familiar with Moses. He was un... He grew up, he understood, memorizing, if you will, his Bible. Daniel had a Bible. He had the sacred writings, and he was familiar with, and he even interacted with, which we'll touch on later. um, In Daniel chapter 9, Dalton will jump into that. Um, Daniel was familiar with the words of Jeremiah. and and I love seeing the way the prophets actually interact with one another. But how would they have understood this concept of someone coming on the clouds of heaven. They would have understood it one way. Any Jew, any Old Testament literate Jew who knew their scriptures, Daniel himself would have immediately understood this one coming on the clouds of heaven as being divine, as being God himself, as being Yehovah, uh, whatever, you know, Adonai, Hashem, right? He would have understood this is God because God is the one that rides on the clouds of heaven. Deuteronomy 33, this is the blessing of Moses. The words that he spoke just before Moses died. Deuteronomy 33, verse 26, it says, there is no one like the God of Jeshurun. Jeshurun is um, either an honorific or a pet name that God has for Israel. It's essentially saying there is no one like the God of Israel who rides across the heavens to help you and on the clouds in his majesty. So there was this idea in ancient times that Baal was the one who rode on the clouds and then God goes, no, 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 no. Baal doesn't ride upon the clouds. I ride on the clouds. I am the one that comes, rides on the chariots through the skies and I I ride on the clouds. Multiple verses refer to God as the cloud rider. Yahweh, God Almighty, Yehovah, however, whatever term you want to use, he alone is the cloud rider. So when you see this one coming to the Ancient of Days, this is God Almighty. You go, wait a minute, I thought the Ancient of Days is God Almighty. Yes, and so is the Son of Man. And that's what's so amazing because, again, we've had all of these promises leading up to Daniel chapter 7. You know, we've had the promises of the crushing one of Genesis 3.15. He will crush your head. You move forward. You've got promises to King David in the Davidic covenant. Someone is coming forward from you and his throne will be established forever. The throne of his kingdom will be established forever, right? But then you have these other promises, such as in Deuteronomy 33, that God will come 
He will come from heaven to save you. So you have the promise of the coming one, and he's a seed of the woman. He's a man. He's a human. But you also have these promises of God coming from heaven, right? And he's going to save Israel. And here in Daniel 7 is where essentially these two revelations that have been moving forward, they've been progressing, they've been blossoming, they've been opening up throughout the scriptures. Here is where they all of a sudden finally all come together. It's where they come together, and Daniel reveals that there is one like a son of man. Now, this doesn't mean he is a human, although, yes, we know Jesus is fully human, fully God. But when he says he's like a son of man, this is the point, is he looks like a human, but he is God Almighty. That's the whole point. And again, any Old Testament literate Jew familiar with the scriptures would have understood this. Psalm 68, verse 4. I'm reading from the uh, New English translation. Sing to God. Sing praises to his name. Extol him who rides on the clouds. I love that. For the Lord is his name. Yehovah is his name. Rejoice before him. He is the one who rides upon the clouds. So throughout the New Testament, and this is where it gets fascinating because with Daniel 7 as the foundation, one who looks like a human, yet he is fully God, coming on the clouds, and then he comes boldly before God. No one does that. No one does that. No one just boldly just comes up before God. No human most certainly doesn't do that. No human can do that and live because this is God. You go, wait a minute. You've got God and you've got God. You've got the Ancient of Days, and you've got the Son of Man, and they are both fully divine. And this is really, I mean, you know, um, within this ancient theological debate uh, between Christians with their Trinity and uh, Jews with their Shema, Adonai Ichad, not Yahid, Ichad, he is unified. He is God alone. But there is a complexity to God. You know, even within, even within Judaism, you have concepts like the Shekinah. You have um, concepts such as the, uh, the angel of the Lord. You know, how do these things work? There is a complexity. God is one. God is absolutely one. But there is a complexity. And Daniel 7 is one of the key texts in the Hebrew Bible. Actually, this is Aramaic. But I mean, in the Jewish Bible that talks about this complexity. The Son of Man is fully God. The Ancient of Days is fully God. Christians, we call this God the Father, God the Son, right? And of course, there's other scriptures that touch on this. Now, here's what's fascinating, is in the New Testament, consistently, the return of Jesus is always portrayed using the imagery and the language of coming on the clouds of heaven. Because the return of the Messiah, the coming of Jesus, is... The fulfillment of all of these prophecies of God coming from heaven combined with the prophecies of the coming one, the crushing one, the king of Israel, the son of David. All of these things become combined and that is why Jesus is the ultimate revelation of God to man. God has chosen to send in the Messiah his very essence into the earth because he is the self-revealing one. He is the one that wants us to know him because in knowing our creator, in knowing him, in knowing him, we find the fullness of all that we were created for. We find the fullness of our emotional and spiritual longings. We find the fullness of joy in his presence. And he wants us to have that. He wants that for us. And so he is thus the self-revealing one. And how has he chosen? Because God can't just rip the curtains open and step into the world because we would be consumed. So how does he reveal himself to us? He veils himself. He takes on the form of like a son of man. He has taken on flesh, but this is God Almighty veiled, and then he comes and he reveals the heart and the essence of who the Ancient of Days is. It is God is on the throne at the height of the heavens, and at the same time, he can step into the earth and reveal who he is to us. Of course God can do that. Of course he can. We're going to jump forward a few verses. Verse 21 and 22, we're going to do a sneak peek into some of the verses that we'll look at next week. Daniel says, I kept looking, and the horn was waging war with the saints and overpowering them until the Ancient of Days came and judgment was passed in favor of the saints of the highest one. Who's the highest one? 
who are the saints of the highest one. The son of man is the highest one. And the time arrived when the saints took possession of the kingdom. 25 and 26, it says that the the little horn will speak out against the most high and wear down the saints of the highest one. The Ancient of Days is called the Most High. The Son of Man is called the Highest One. Almost identical terms, slightly different in the Hebrew, but they both are referring to God Almighty. The Ancient of Days is the Most High, but the saints, the people of the Highest One, are the people of the Son of Man, the people of Jesus. And it says the Antichrist will wear them down. We'll look at that some more next week. And then in verse 27, then the sovereignty, the dominion, and the greatness of all the kingdoms under the whole heaven will be given to the people of the saints of the highest one. The Son of Man will be given dominion and authority over all the earth forever, right? The people of the saints of the highest one, his kingdom will be an everlasting kingdom, and all dominions will serve and obey him. So it reiterates what it had previously said of the Son of Man. And again, four times he is called the highest one. Jesus, the Son of Man, is called the highest one. Now, he will receive a dominion, a kingdom, and it will be everlasting. His kingdom will be an everlasting kingdom. All dominions will serve and obey him. Now, previously, in Psalm 2 as well as Psalm 72, it was revealed that the Son of David would be much more than just a king of Israel, but actually his authority would extend to the ends of the earth. The nations would be given as his inheritance. He would be a global, universal ruler. But it's here in Daniel 7 that those initial statements come together in the most concise, powerful statement that this one is coming and he will rule the entire earth. All of the earth will be his dominion and it will, it will last forever. His kingdom will encompass the whole globe. It's not just Israel. Yes, it's, it's a headquarters, if you will, is Zion. From Zion, the knowledge of God, the law of God would go out all over all the earth. And it would cover the earth as the waters cover the sea. Yes, but it's global. It's not just. This is when Israel will rule the world because their king, the son of David, will be on the throne, right? Okay, so son of man. Now get this. This is how important is Daniel 7. Son of man is used throughout the Gospels 78 times. The term Christ, or Messiah, is only used 49 times. 78 times Son of Man, 49 times Christ. Son of God, 25 times. Son of David, 14 times. That's, that's a, in terms of understanding how important Daniel 7 was in the first century, how important it was to Jesus in his own revelation, self-identification of who he was, it was overwhelmingly the premier and primary term that he used to describe himself. It was used by Jesus to refer to himself 78 times. He referred to himself as the Messiah 11 times. He referred to himself as the Son of God five times, and he referred to himself as the Son of David once once 78 times so we should pay attention now now here's what's fascinating is because um, this portion of the book of daniel was written in aramaic again most of the bible is written in hebrew the old testament is written in hebrew but there are some portions of uh, daniel as well as um, nehemiah some portions are in aramaic this portion of daniel 7 of daniel is in aramaic so the son of man here is, it's an Aramaic term, it is bar anasha. Aramaic, Hebrew, they're similar, they're a little different. In Hebrew, the son of man, which is used, by the way, for Ezekiel, throughout the book of Ezekiel, he is called ben Adam, or ben Adam, right? So he is the son of, son of man, that's what God calls Ezekiel, but there is only one reference in the Old Testament to bar anasha. And this is the term that Jesus would have referred to himself as. He did, Jesus didn't call himself Ben Adam. He called himself Bar Anasha. So that when he said that, people knew that he was pointing to, he was pointing to Daniel chapter 7, and everyone knew it. Everyone knew it. How do we know that? Well, let's look at this. When he called himself the Son of Man, He was accused of blasphemy. When Jesus called himself the Son of Man, he was not saying, I'm human. He was saying, that's me in Daniel 7. I'm the one. 
I'm the one who is God Almighty. Matthew 26, 62 through 63. The high priest stood up and said to him, Do you not answer? What is it that these men are testifying against you? But Jesus kept silent. And the high priest said to him, I adjure you by the living God that you tell us whether you are the Messiah, the Christ, the Son of God. But Jesus kept silent. And the high priest said, I'm sorry. Darn it. Okay, so here's what is... here. <clears throat> Okay, so now here is another really fascinating thing, is that uh, most of the Old Testament, of course, it's written in Hebrew, right? But there are portions that are written in Aramaic, and portions of Daniel are written in Aramaic, including Daniel chapter 7. So this term, son of man, it's used elsewhere in the Old Testament. Ezekiel is repeatedly referred to as the son of man, but that was in Hebrew. He was called Ben-Adam. Ben Adam, as we would say in English, right? In Hebrew, Ben Adam. But in Aramaic, here in Daniel chapter 7, it's Bar Anasha. That's Aramaic. Aramaic is a different language, similar to Hebrew, but it is a little bit different. Now, Jesus, when he referred to himself as the Son of Man, he didn't call himself Ben Adam. He called himself Bar Anasha. How do we know that? Well, we know that because when he said it, he was accused of blasphemy. When Jesus calls himself the Son of Man, he's not calling himself a human. He's calling himself God Almighty. And this was the overwhelming primary way that he identifies himself throughout the scriptures more than any other term. How do we know that Jesus used the term bar Anasha? Well, let's look at the examples. Matthew 26, 62 through 63. The high priest stood up and he said to him, Do you not answer? What is it that these men are testifying against you? But Jesus kept silent. And the high priest said to him, I adjure you by the living God that you tell us whether you are the Messiah, the Christ, the Son of God. Jesus said to him, You have said it yourself. <laughs> Nevertheless, I tell you hereafter, you will see the Son of Man sitting at the right hand of power and coming on the clouds of heaven. So he goes, look, I am the Son of Man, the one spoken of in Daniel 7, and I'm coming back to judge the living and the dead. I'm the one that has been appointed by God to judge the living and the dead because the Son of Man is the one that will judge on behalf of the Ancient of Days, right? Then the high priest tore his robes and said he has blasphemed. He has blasphemed. What further need do we have any? So they, they throw a fit, right? When Jesus called himself the Son of Man, he clearly was using the Aramaic bar and Asha. He was pointing to Daniel chapter 7. And then get this, Stephen, the first Christian martyr, was killed specifically for stating that Jesus was the Son of Man. Acts 7, verse 51 through 54. You men who are stiff-necked and uncircumcised in your heart and ears, you are always resisting the Holy Spirit. He's already saying some pretty offensive stuff. You are doing just as your fathers did. Which one of the prophets did your fathers not persecute? They killed those who had previously announced the coming of the righteous one, whose betrayers and murderers you have now become. You who received the law ordained by angels, did you not keep it? You know, he's giving a very in-house rebuke. Stephen, a faithful Jew, is re rebuking his fellow countrymen. Now, when they heard this, they were cut to the quick, and they began gnashing in their teeth at him. They were already upset, but here was the issue that drove it home. But being full of the Holy Spirit, young Stephen, he gazed intently into heaven. He saw the glory of God, and Jesus standing at the right hand of God. This is after the resurrection. And he said, Behold, I see the heavens opened up and the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. But they cried out with a loud voice and they covered their ears and they rushed at him with one impulse. When they had driven him out of the city, they stoned him to death. It was when Stephen said that I see the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. They understood that he was testifying to the very same thing that got Jesus crucified, if you will. The very same thing, blasphemy to say that this is the one that was spoken of in Daniel chapter 7. This is the one that you've crucified. This is the one that all of the prophets have been talking about. 
So this is a biggie. Guys, we're going to end it right here because we're just a little over 45 minutes. Next week, uh, I'm sorry, in the next study, the next class, we'll pick up and we're, I will actually want to come back to this theme a bit before we move into the rest of the chapter. But you can see there's just so much here. We could spend multiple classes just on these uh, handful of verses. This is the center um, of Daniel, of the entire book of Daniel, and it's the center of um, Daniel 7 itself. So amen and amen, Maranatha guys. We'll see you next time.